Part of my talk, I'm going to describe a method that we've developed at Sandia, me along with Martin Droman, on certifying reduced order models. So if you recall from earlier in the talk, I proposed and developed error bounds along with my collaborators for both the LSPG and the Galerkin ROMs. Unfortunately, those bounds grow exponentially in time. So they tend to be not very sharp, and they tend to overestimate the error by quite a bit. That's known as having, exhibiting poor effectivity. And this is very common for both dynamical system reduced order models and dynamical system reduced order models, especially in the nonlinear case. So we've decided to adapt a totally different perspective on error analysis for reduced order models that's based on machine learning methods. And the idea is to apply machine learning methods to generate a statistical model of the reduced order model error by mining the data that's that's produced by the reduced order model itself. And hopefully we can get away with, a, with a, a model of the error that is much closer to reality and doesn't overpredict by many orders of magnitude. So what are existing strategies for ROM error quantification? The most common approach for doing ROM error quantification is to devise rigorous error bounds, which is nice because we know that we'll rigorously bound the error. But unfortunately, um, we're going exhi to often exhibit high effectivity or overestimation especially for these nonlinear time-dependent problems. And improving that effectivity often incurs very high costs or some intrusive reformulation of the discretization. So the, the, these uh, successive constraint methods are very expensive um, and in, intrusive reformulation by Mazzayano and some of his collaborators. The idea there, and, as well as Tony Patera and uh, Carson Urban, the idea there is they actually develop a space-time uh, discretization for the original PDE, and they show that applying the reduced spaces method to that, uh, to that a uh, space-time model yields a, a, a t an error bound that grows much more slowly in time. Furthermore, rigorous error bounds only bound the error. They don't give you any statistics about the error, right? So if we're using uh, the ROMs in an uncertainty quantification context, it's much more attractive to have some statistical description of the reduced order model error. Another way of, of quantifying ROM errors is a so-called multi-fidelity correction approach. This was pioneered by Mike Eldred almost 12 years ago. At Sandia. So the idea here is if, is if we have the, the reduced order model, let's say this is Z, so we, we have our inputs mu and our outputs, and over some training set I can evaluate both my reduced order model and my full order model output response. So this is like, let's say, the drag produced by the ROM and the drag produced by the full model, and I have many instances of those. I can then model how the ROM error behaves in the input space, right, using Gaussian process regression or some other data fit technique. So we're going to model the low fidelity error as a function of the, of the inputs, and then you can use, so that, that yields this model of the ROM error, let's say. Um, and then we can then, what we can do is when we, when we use the ROM for prediction, we can take the ROM prediction and actually correct it with this function to generate a hopefully better prediction of the actual, of the actual output quantity of interest. So this is nice because it's amenable to statistics if we use some kind of Gaussian process or statistical process, stochastic process for building that model but it suffers from the curse of dimensionality because we have to build a model of the error in the entire input space. So imagine we have 100 input parameters or let's say even 10 input parameters. We need a lot of data to be able to train that error model. And further, what, what, they, what these authors also observed is that the ROM errors tend to be highly oscillatory in the input space. Namely, if we have some training points, we know the ROM error is almost zero at those points and it tends to grow quite quickly away from those points. So you basically have this oscillatory behavior of the ROM error in the input space. So this is generally why this method doesn't tend to work well with reduced order models. Although it has worked well for other types of surrogates, like the, like, like the lower fidelity uh, coarse and mesh type, type uh, surrogate model. So what we're going to do is something different. And it's, it's driven by uh, a, a sort of a data-driven observation that we've made. So this is, this is an example I'll show later in the talk. But what we see is that uh, the ROM produces error indicators. So the residual and the error bound, that's shown on the x-axis, that tend to correlate with the actual ROM error, which is on the y-axis. So keep in mind, when we run the ROM, I'm able to compute the quantities on the x-axis, and I generally cannot compute the real error unless I run the full model. But what we see over our training data is that these cheaply computable ROM variable, ROM outputs, the residual and error bound, tend to correlate very strongly with the reduced order model error. And that lends into, and, and that is basically the kernel of our idea, which is that we would like to generate a, a data-driven mapping that maps these error indicators to a distribution over the true error. And we're going to use Gaussian process regression for that purpose. And the advantage here is that this is totally independent of the input space dimension. So even if I'm operating in a 100-dimensional parameter space, 
The ROM will generally de generate only a, s a very small number of error indicators that are required to build this mapping. So in this example, actually, you, we're in a nine-dimensional parameter space, but we can use even just one parameter, the, the dual norm of the residual, to build this mapping that is very low variance and is quite predictive. And we call this approach the reduced order model error surrogates or ROMs method. So the, the, it, it, to be a little more formal about what we're doing, we take our error indicator row that we somehow define, and we map that with Gaussian process regression to some transformed error. So we, we allow the existence of some transformation function that is sometimes maybe a logarithmic transformation, or you can use any transformation whatsoever. So what, what the main idea is, is we approximate a deterministic mapping from parameters to a transformed ROM error. So think of this as just the ROM error, right? So for a given point in parameter space, we get one ROM error. We're going to approximate that deterministic mapping by a stochastic mapping, which is lower dimensional, which goes from the error indicator to a model for that transformed error. And the reason it's stochastic is because, as you can see from these data, for a given value of, of the, an error indicator, we, we don't exactly know what the ROM error is, but we have a pretty good handle on what it is. So that's why it's a stochastic model. D is going to be an invertible transformation function. D tilde denotes a random variable for the transformed error. And then delta tilde, which is just D inverse applied to delta D tilde, is a random variable for the error. So the ingredients that we need to define to, to employ the ROMs method, number one, what are the error indicators? What data does, does the ROM produce that I can use to build a mapping? Number two, what's a good transformation function? What, what should we use for D? And finally, what statistical model should we use? And we're going to use the Gaussian process for that. And what are the desired conditions that we're going to, that we're going to hope for that will guide the decision of these ingredients? Number one, we would like our error indicators to be low dimensional. We don't want to be dealing with a huge number of these indicators. And they should be cheaply computable, right? We want the ROM to kind of generate those during the course of its simulation almost for free. We would like the, distribu the distribution of the random variable to have low variance, right? If this model has a huge amount of variance, what that says is that we don't really know what our ROM error is. So we'd like to build a, a model that yields a very low variance so we can nail down what our ROM error is with a high degree of certainty. Finally, we need to validate or cross-validate our statistical model. So we can postulate many different ingredients um, and fit it to data, but if it's not cross-validated, then we have, no, uh, we, we have no assurance that our model is any good. So let's consider one type of ROM errors, and we'll build up the, the ROMs method for, for, the, for this type of error. So let, let's look at, for example, the, states, the, the, the L2 norm, or the norm of the state space error. So for state space errors, ROMs are often equipped with error bounds. That I derived one earlier in this talk. These bounds delta, like capital delta, uh, are guaranteed to bound the ROM error. And what's been observed by a variety of researchers, including John Luigi Rosa and some of his works, which we cite in our paper, um, is that the effectivity, namely the amount of overprediction of this error bound, often lies in a relatively small range in practice. So we can just write this as eta one is, is a lower bound for, for eta, which is an upper, and eta two is an upper bound for, for that quantity as well, for all mu. This, this has been observed by several authors. If we take the logarithm of this, we can generate the following result, which is obviously a heuristic result, which states that if we adopt the following Rome's ingredients, so if we take our, our, our indicator to be the logarithm of the error bound, in a transformation uh, function, where, uh, of, uh, in a logarithmic transformation function, then our, then our error behaves essentially as an affine function within some range, right? So this is saying that if I, if I apply this transformation and this is my error indicator, and, and so is that, then my error will lie in some range between these two, these two uh, affine curves. <clears throat> so we're also going to consider <clears throat> the log of the dual norm of the residual, because these error bounds are often defined as simply the dual norm of the residual divided by this coercivity constant in the, in the reduced basis literature. And this coercivity constant is often really hard to compute. So essentially, if we assume this, this coercivity constant is well behaved, then we should have a similar result here when we just use the, the log of the two norm of the residual, right? And that's much easier to compute for us. So I, I acknowledge this is a very heuristic result, but I'll show you that it works very well in practice, um, and, and, uh, and it, it can lead to very low variance uh, error models. Now let's consider just general error. So, so we talked about the error being the, the two norm of the state space error. Now let's talk about the ROM being just some error in some output quantity of interest, where g is just some general function, which defines an output quantity of interest. So recall from earlier in the talk, in the H refinement part of the talk, that the dual-weighted residual method, which I've kind of put here with easier notation, 
provides the fir a first order approximation of the error in the output quantity of interest. So we have from this dual weighted residual theory or adjoint theory, we have some first order approximation of the output error where the adjoint satisfies this equation shown here. <clears throat> As before, we want to avoid adjoint solves with the fine model, so we can approximate this using a reduced order model, where we introduce some other uh, reduced space, let's say big Y, where, 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 where we now can say that our, our approximated dual solve satisfies this Gerlichen projection applied to the adjoint solution. Then we get a, a much more cheaply computable approximation to first order of the output quantity of interest. And this result shows us, again, somewhat heuristically, that if we apply uh, as an error indicator this dual weighted residual that was cheaply computable um, and a transformation function of the identity matrix, <clears throat> then we get a pretty good model of what the ROM error is. Because this is saying that the ROM error is basically linear with respect to this row. Right? So then hopefully, if, this, if these assumptions are all true, then the error, which is the quantity on the left here, is exactly equal to this error indicator, right? So that's why these, this, this indicator and this transformation function are justified by this analysis. Another thing to note here is that because we're building a reduced order model for the dual solve, this enables uncertainty control, meaning that we can somehow refine our dual basis Y, possibly by H refinement, in order to generate more and more accurate error indicators, because our best error indicator is really the, the, the Y that comes from the full order model uh, adjoint solve. So the Rome's method again, we're going we're gonna to construct a stochastic process of the, of the ROM error, select a small number of indicators that are cheaply computable and lead to low variance of the stochastic process. And our first attempt to do so will be a Gaussian process such that the variables have a joint Gaussian distribution. So what is a Gaussian process? So a Gaussian process is simply a collection of random variables, any finite number of which have a joint Gaussian distribution. So what this is saying is that if we apply this for our, our purposes, our surrogate model for our transformed error, which is a function of the error indicators, is behaved as, behaves as a Gaussian process with some mean process that depends on rho, or rho is, rho is my independent variable, and some covariance, excuse me, some covariance function. And given a training set of transformed errors and error indicators, we can use Bayesian inference to infer what this mean function is and this covariance function is. And we're going to use the canonical result of Rasmussen and Williams in their great text of kernel regression. And so just in pictures, the way that this works is we start with some prior distribution. So we say that our prior distribution is that our transformed error behaves as a Gaussian process with a mean zero and a covariance matrix given by some covariance function, which is often taken to be the, this, uh, this Gaussian kernel. We're going to add some additive noise here because we know that our mapping will not be deterministic because of, of the nature of, of our particular application. Um, we can divide our, our uh, instances of our, of our indicators into a training set and a prediction set, and then we apply Bayesian inference to compute what our Gaussian process is given the training set. So this is essentially how, in a nutshell, these methods work. So then, in a, so then now that we have defined all these ingredients, how does the ROMS method really work? So during the offline stage, we populate our ROMS database with a set of transformed errors and candidate error indicators that we, that we postulate. We then identify a few of those error indicators that lead to a low variance GP. We're working on automating this right now. And then we use those error indicators to construct a Gaussian process via Bayesian inference using all this data. Right? So this is the offline stage for the ROMS method. Then during the online stage, for any point in the parameter space, we first solve the ROM. We then compute the error indicators that come for free with the ROM. This allows us to obtain a distribution of what we think the ROM is, or sorry, of what we think the ROM error is. Right? This is a random variable for the ROM error. We, we, can, we can obtain that by applying the inverse transformation function. And then because we have a random variable for the ROM error, we can then apply that as a correction to the ROM solution. So let's look at how this, this method works on a simple thermal block problem. So this is just solving a Poisson equation uh, in two dimensions over nine different subdomains. Each subdomain is characterized by its own conductivity constant, and that's going to define the set of parameters that, that we use in our problem. So we, it's a nine-dimensional parameter space. These conductivity constants will vary in a range of 0.1 to 10. Uh, and we're going to build a ROM using the RB greedy method that was proposed by Paderet and Rosa. It's sort of in the RB community. You can look it up. It's a very standard approach to, to building a reduced order model for this problem. And it's stationary, so we don't have to worry about these nonlinear dynamical issues, like these nonlinear dynamics issues that we talked about earlier in this, in this talk. So let's first consider the energy norm of the error. So we're going we're to say that our error in this case is going to be the energy norm of the state space error. 
So what we can see is if we plot the energy norm of the state space error over a training set, where our indicator is either the, the, the error bound in red or the, dual norm, or, or the dual norm of the residual, we get a very good correlation structure. And if we plot them both, we see a very nice relationship between these quantities. So first of all, this, this is lens insight that the residual norm and error bound correlate with the real error. So these are good indicators. Um, and so what we're going to do is, as su suggested by our analysis, use the log of the dual norm of the residual, which is cheaper than the error bound, and the logarithmic transformation function. This is what we proposed earlier in this talk for this type of error, right? It looks promising. We were able to generate a pretty low variance model. But how well can we actually validate this model? And it turns out you can. So what I'm showing here is as we increase the number of training instances from 10 to 35 to 65 to 95, I'm plotting, first of all, what our Gaussian process thinks the variance is, what our model is, and actually what our histogram is of how our data uh, of how our data uh, line up according to, to, to what our predicted variance and our predicted distribution looks like. And what we see is as we, if we consider, let's say, confidence intervals, our predicted confidence intervals are aligning very well with what our numerics are showing us and what our, what our computed histograms are giving us. So if we look at the 80, 90, 95, 98, 99 percent confidence intervals, our data are actually aligning with that with the appropriate frequency as we increase the number of, of, of samples that we use to train our Gaussian process. So we've, we, we've validated or cross-validated our model in this way. If we now consider a compliant output error, so this is basically the norm of, of an output quantity of interest which associates with the right-hand side of our, of our governing equations. Uh, we again see that the residual and error bound correlate with the real error. And if we look at instead, compare our method with a multi-fidelity approach where we have nine input parameters. So we're trying to model what, so, so I'm plotting here in, in terms of the parameters mu1 and mu2 what the output error looks like, we see that there's no clear structure that's cropping up here. So this suggests right away that the multi-fidelity approach, which is the most common approach, are very bad, uh, it does not behave well, which is another way of saying that the input parameters are very bad indicators. We should be using residual norms and errors, not inputs to build our, our mapping and our model of the error. If we again apply a validation process, so we're going to compute the frequency that we lie in the appropriate confidence interval as a function of the training parameters, so that our method, we, we're converging very nicely to the appropriate confidence intervals. If we apply the multi-fidelity approach, approach, which is just bromes with, with the input parameters as the indicators, we don't get any such convergence, right? And the reason is because it's a high dimensional problem and we have oscillatory ROM errors. So there's no reason that we should really expect this method to work. <coughs> we can also show how well our method works by adding the mode of the, of the ROM's error, of the ROM's predicted error to our prediction and compute what the expected improvement is. So this quantity is basically saying, if I take my full order model uh, output quantity of interest and I subtract off my corrected reduced order model uh, solution, how does that relate to what the, what the uncorrected reduced order model uh, error is? And so we want this quantity to be as close to zero as possible. So again, as I increase the number of training instances, my ROM is almost always improving the error, sometimes by almost two orders of magnitude. So I'm, I'm reducing the, the, output quant the output error by quite a bit with our approach. Um, what I'm showing here is, is, the, uh, is if, if instead of using our method, you apply a uniform distribution uh, in, the, in the input space. This is basically an alternative method that's explained more in the paper. Um, comparing this with the multi-fidelity correction approach, you see that they exhibit no such luck. And only in such certain extreme cases do they ever improve the error, but in general, they make the error much worse, four orders of magnitude worse, right? So if we now consider error in the general output, if you recall, we proposed uh, identity matrix as a transformation matrix and the dual weighted residuals as indicators. What we see is as we increase the dual reduced basis dimension, we get a better and better model. Keep in mind this problem is linear, so eventually in some limit, we should expect a perfect uh, linear relationship between the indicators and the error. And we see that, 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 that these particular ingredients can yield a very low variance uh, Gaussian process. And in particular, this enables uncertainty control that we can actually control how good our error indicator is by solving higher and higher fidelity uh, dual weighted residual problems. Um, if I now plot the expected improvement, recall we want this to be as close to zero as possible. As we add columns to Y, so we're increasing our ROM fidelity, we get more and more improvement in our solution to the point where we're getting two orders of magnitude improvement when we use a dimension of uh, a dimension 20 for our reduced order model, for our reduced order model for the, the uh, adjoint solution. So just to summarize, 
The Romans method takes a totally different approach to error analysis. We're not devising rigorous error bounds. We're instead building a statistical model of the ROM error using machine learning techniques. We use cheap indicators to statistically quantify the ROM error. We show that we outperform the typical multi-fidelity correction approach. And we show that we can actually control the uncertainty that we're introducing by using uh, better and better bases for the dual problem. Related follow-on work was done by Andrea Manzoni and some of his collaborators on this reduction error models approach, which is very related to what I just showed. Um, and our current work now is to apply this to nonlinear time-dependent problems. So the idea in this case with uh, Simi Trehan and Lou Derlovsky at Stanford is to apply high-dimensional regression methods for machine learning to automate the construction of Rome's models in the nonlinear dynamical system case. So if you're interested, you can look at our, my paper with Martin, which is published in the SIAM UQ Journal 2015. And although I know you can't ask me any questions, I would be happy to take them in theory. And that really concludes this talk. So I appreciate all of your time. If you're interested in, in further information or you would like to ask me any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is at sandia.gov. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I hope to hear from you.